This mini series is brought to you by Harding, a friend of the Automation Ladies and the Industrial Connectivity Team on a mission to prove that every connection matters. Are you going to IMTS this year in Chicago? Well, Nikki is, and so is Harding. If you're walking around the IMTS show floor this year, you'll notice Harding connectors powering robots of all shapes and sizes and moving data through automation machinery. You can stop by their in-booth demo truck experience and get hands-on with Harding's famous modular connectors. And you can even customize your own, just like Lego. For a little more information about Harding, check out our episode from season three with Ed and Goda, where we talk a little bit more about why the heck should we care about connectors. As always, we encourage you to connect with and get to know the people in our community. So go ahead and look up Ed, Goda, or Amanda Marks from Harding on LinkedIn and connect with them. You can also learn more about Harding at harding.com. This mini series will run until September during IMTS. And then after IMTS, we will kick off season five of Automation Ladies, the audio podcast, with some pre recordings that we have in backlog. You can look for our LinkedIn lives starting in October with our live recap from the AHTD fall meeting in Bellevue, Washington. And we should be doing regular LinkedIn lives on Thursdays at 3 p.m. Central starting in October 2024. Finally, follow us, connect with us. Please write us a review on your favorite podcast platform and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Automation Ladies, if you haven't seen our content over there yet. And with that, welcome to our new mini series with Harding. I hope you guys are having a great summer. All right, welcome to another segment here, live recording at Automate 2024. You've got the Automation Ladies and our second interview of the day with another Automation Lady. Casey, welcome. Thanks for staying Thank down you. with us. Thanks for having me, guys. We had a really fun conversation with Ed and Goda uh, that came out on the podcast last week. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have time, like most of our recordings, when we actually like the people we talk to and we have a great conversation. We could have probably talked for another hour about yes. the innovations but they also pointed out that, hey, why don't we talk to you? Uh, the VP of Development and Innovation. Did I get that right? Yes, that's correct. It's a very cool title. Uh, and I would love to hear, A, like, I know this is not an Automation Ladies episode and we don't have an hour. <laughs> but since we're just meeting, can you just give us a little bit of, like, background story as to how the heck did you get so into innovating and connectors? Yes. So, actually, I had a chance to listen to your podcast on personal branding. And you describe uh -huh. your career as, like, a series of happy accidents. And yeah. So by happy accident, I ended up at Harding. Um, it wasn't a brand I was familiar with before I joined the company, but I really had the chance to start at what was the beginning of a big growth period and bring in you know, project management and engineering into the company, into the North American company. We're very strong in our German headquarters. And the growth that we've been able to achieve has allowed me to really grow my career and do things that I didn't think would be possible. So um, about four years ago, I spoke with my manager, who's John D'Souza. He's the CEO of North America. And he said, hey, we'd like to start up product development in the Americas. <laughs> That's yes, please. Company? It was huge. That's not too common. No. Right? I think they generally like to kind of do things from their headquarters and dictate down to the rest of the world how they like things done. Yeah, right? absolutely. <laughs> and so what we're seeing in the U.S. market is that our customers are innovating so quickly, you cannot possibly keep up from another continent. Yeah. And you need to have the cultural appreciation of how Americans innovate. Americans innovate, fail fast, fail quickly, fail first. Failure is a success. You've learned something. That's not part of German culture. No. German engineering different. is very pre-planned, very focused on quality. And that's why they make amazing high quality products like Harding Cells, you know, like BMW, Audi, these are very famous German brands. That's not fast though. So it's a different approach to innovation and they're really focused on highly complex, highly secure products. If you want to do quick iterations and derivatives, you need a different type of culture in your development team. And that's so, you know, purpose built for the American form of innovation. So four years ago, we started development. It was right before COVID. So that sort of changed our plans a little bit and we had to be nimble. And then just a few years after that, we implemented a new strategy globally where we built out these innovation teams. And so now we have two here in the U.S. that have been tremendously successful for us. And it's just been a blast. It's not anything I would have expected that I was going to do when I started at the company, but it's been so much fun and getting to build this team of elite engineers that really know how to fund. And we innovate all day long, but it's not like we 
have a particular passion for connectivity. We have a passion for developing new things, working with our customers, and that translates to any product that you want to make. And connectivity is really just such an integral part of an ecosystem that even though it is kind of a specific part of it, you can see all the downstream and upstream like things, the innovations that it's enabling. Totally. And so I would say if I met a I hate when people are at, you're at a party and someone asks, oh, what do you do? That's like the <laughs> least important part about me. But if someone says that, I'm like, I work in a lot of data center applications okay. because that's what I do. I empower data centers through connectors or you might empower semiconductor machine making, automation, robotics. The connector is one piece of that, but I see myself as an extended part of their team. Yeah, I mean, essentially part of, you can say, connector and connectivity innovation has enabled the super high speed, high bandwidth, you know, internet capabilities that we have now that have enabled all this AI innovation. Absolutely, right? absolutely. They're all linked in a way because mm-hmm. you can't do one without the other. And right. the physical infrastructure, obviously, is really important for all these nebulous cloud software, AI applications that everybody is super excited about. Yeah, and we see the the back end of that where AI is driving power consumption. Yeah. So 2% of the U.S.'s power consumption is coming from data centers. And we're powering the data center. So it shows how important the technology that we're doing, if we can be more efficient with our technology, if we can help data centers, we're actually saving energy. We're improving CO2 reduction. That's like all of the things that make my heart sing. Yeah. Efficiency, improving CO2, right? And you're doing it through a connector, which is something that a lot of people don't think about. That's that's how I feel good about what we do every day. It's part of what I love about your company's general feel. I, I see that you guys have invested in doing marketing differently. You brought someone from outside the industry with like a fresh look mm-hmm. at things. Not not this, hey, this is how we've always done and we're just going to continue doing it. Yeah. Um, I've also seen a lot of companies from overseas fail at growing as much in the U.S. as they would like. And I think a big part of it is they haven't embraced the fact that they do have to do things a little bit differently here. Yes. You guys opened an innovation center, right? Mm-hmm. Um, where is that located? And can people just come like visit it? What what is that? Yeah. Has what has that done for you guys? Or, or... Mm-hmm. so a lot of global brands are opening innovation centers where it's like a look and feel type of thing where you come and interact with the product. Ours is a lab right in the heart of these tech epicenters on the East Coast and the West Coast where we're doing co-creation with these big universities and with these startups. So we kind of went the opposite approach. And the the reason for that is to look and feel at a Harding product alone without context makes no sense. But you know what's really cool? When you walk over to the Fanuc booth and you see Harding connectors powering those robots that are doing dancing right now. So when you integrate our products with our customers' products, that's when the story becomes real. And that's a big part of our marketing journey here in the Americas as well is realizing that at headquarters in Germany, people know the Harding brand. And here, marketing is so different. The way that you interact with somebody is different. The kind of references they're looking for. I don't think there's anybody, you know, think about the cultural differences. I don't think there's anybody in Germany sitting at a trade show with a lady in a purple jacket and a cowboy hat talking about automation, <laughs> right? This is like such a cool, like American thing that we're doing. And we're we're embracing the differences and really respecting what each country brings to the table that's unique too. That is a really good point. I used to think sometimes that like we were really behind in the U.S. on certain things um, compared to Europe. But I think on this front, actually, we are innovating more or having more fun with this like new styles of marketing, having conversations, communities. I know they're doing some of that in Europe as well. Uh, And some of our colleagues have gone over to like Hanover Mass and stuff like that. But I think we really are a little bit more at the forefront of that. Mm Um, and it's great to see the bigger companies, the behemoths like the Siemens and the Rockwells start to embrace more of an ecosystem mentality. Yeah. I'm sure a company like yours, you work closely with all of them, right? Yeah, You're not going to be, you know, only in one side or the other. Mm-hmm. But seeing like different partnerships at these shows and then being able to collect, it's so much more fun when you're like, hey, you can go see Harding. Yeah, come to our booth, but you yes. can also go to like 10 other ones. Yeah. And absolutely. just see them in practice yeah. with different partners, different friends. For me, I, maybe as a younger person, I just, I think that that's more fun. It's a more fun way of working. Yeah. And I think it's important to have also the traditional routes as well. So there are engineers that want that catalog. They want to be able to flip through it and pick out the part numbers. So they've got your part numbers memorized and keeping everybody in mind. I think that's a really big challenge for marketing, but also innovation. Yeah. Because the number one thing I ask customers is like, what challenges are you facing? Don't talk to me about connectors. That's like the third conversation we're going to have. 
what's what are the challenges you're facing with your robots? What are the challenges you're facing with your conveyor systems? And then trust me to translate that back to how can I be ready for you with the next generation of connectors? And different generations express those problems differently. Yeah. Right? So what I find is in and now somehow as a millennial, I'm like sandwiched between I I'm now realizing I'm not the young person in the room anymore. I know we used to be the youngest one, right? It feels like not that long ago. And I have three kids and a mortgage. I am not <laughs> young anymore. Um, but I'm finding that millennials and Gen Zs are more comfortable sharing problem statements. Yeah. And I think for some of our, the generations that trained us in the workforce, that's almost like, that's private. We're not going to tell you what challenges we're facing. So it was harder to extract voice of customer. And you go talk to a younger engineer and they're like, well, let me tell you. Yeah. I got all these problems and maybe you can help me solve them. And sometimes you can and sometimes you can't. But even the networking that we're doing now, we're building up the networks to say, actually, I've got a great person for you to go, go talk to over here at this company. Maybe they can help you out. So it's a totally different system. I will say that millennials and Gen Z will not pick up the phone and call somebody. They don't. We don't want to. No. <laughs> Thank you for <laughs> reinforcing that. Yes, I've been saying that for a while. And <laughs> and the truth is, though, like you're right. Some people, if they if they've gotten the catalog down, Right. They know where to find things. They know how to look for it. They've been specking things like that for years. Don't take that away from them and say, oh, now you have to go on this online thing and figure it all out no. from scratch. And, you know, oh, it's better yeah. for you. Right. Like leave the legacy options as long as you can support them, because ultimately time is money. Right. And people invest time in learning how to do things a certain way. Yeah. And unless they need to, you know, not everybody has to change their ways constantly. Right. Uh, but at the same time, like they're is a huge difference between what the new workforce expects. Totally. And they will not be told to go learn how to read the catalog and spec things the old way. And you have to be willing to offer the experiences that the customer wants. Right. Right. In different ways. And we were talking earlier, I think it was when we were with Sandro with Festo and and Harding providing those kind of self-service configurators. Mm -hmm. But then you have to be able to answer the phone as soon as somebody wants help. Yes. And they want you to be very, very, very efficient. And people do not want to be sold to. No, right? absolutely not. They want to feel like you're very genuine in their interaction. And so that really changes the way you go to market, right? You have to deliver. It's not just about beautiful messaging, which I think is more relevant on the consumer side. On B2B, it's a whole different ballgame. Yeah. It's all about how can you actually be there for me as a valuable supplier, right? Provide the information I'm looking for mm-hmm. without BS. <laughs> yeah. And feeling like you can actually trust what you're hearing from a supplier. Yeah, exactly. And I think, honestly, the most successful companies today, they think of their suppliers not as, you know, as kind of a part of the team, right? Mm-hmm. It's an it's an ancillary support. It's part of your ecosystem. And right. if you treat your suppliers with respect and you realize they bring value, you share enough to let them help you. Right. Instead of, yeah, this old way of like, well, I'm not going to tell you my problem, but you sell me and I'll tell you whether or not I want it. Yeah. It's like, why are we, we're wasting everybody's time with that. Yeah. And And I think to build upon that, if you're a young engineer coming into the workforce, it's going to be a lot more fulfilling for you in your career if you truly feel like you're helping your customers solve problems that are real and you're not yeah. fabricating a problem to sell your product. So being able to go walk your customer's production floor, see the problem yourself, or even find it yourself and the customer didn't realize it and say, I can solve that problem. There's no better way to be inspired to innovate and create something totally new. I will say too, would you say for innovation, like, and I've read some reports and studied this for a while, uh, but diversity really helps spark innovative ideas. Yes. And that's diversity of all different types. Mm-hmm. But I think also like having some broad experiences. So I am a huge advocate of people like in their careers. And I think Ali will say as well, take different types of jobs if you can. Yeah. Like go do field install, work for a systems integrator or an OEM. And then maybe you work at a plant. Like there's different ways, but you kind of, all those different experiences, the more dots you can connect that normal that other people generally don't yeah that's innovation right Mm -hmm. then you can come up with solutions or kind of off the beaten path things you can learn from one sector and bring it into another yeah do you guys see that you know this cross this collaborative kind of effort that as you work with customers does that bleed into how you help other customers and then the products that you build yeah absolutely i think diversity experiences and getting that real hands-on experience is so important that's why every you know, junior engineer, they need to go out to customers. They need to have an emergency that happens that they have to solve. I mean, one of the best things that happened to me in my first year of working was I got a call who can be on a plane in an hour. I need you to go to San Francisco and 
and reinstall 30 printers that were installed incorrectly. Okay, I'm going to go out there. You learn so much and you bring it back to the workforce. And you also have an appreciation for the person that's using your product. Because if all you ever do is interact with a keyboard, you're never going to solve a customer problem. And I think it's hard to really understand customer problems if you've never been in their shoes, not even a tiny bit, right? Um, Allie, I'm sure you have something to say about this. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, my, my, oh, well. So I'm going to tag you in. Okay. So I used to work for a German company and, you know, we were the American version of it. And I definitely, you touched on this earlier, but, you know, talking about, uh, or what we would say is that like, yeah, the, the Germans can't produce for the Americans on an American timeline. And so is there, are there other differences? Cause you've talked about some of them, but like, what are some other differences that make like what we do in the U S different? Yeah, I think that I see a big difference in the consumer side and, and that actually pulls through to how we do development. So the German business mindset is very planned far forward, which is great. So it also means when they need a new product, they don't need it yesterday. Like we always joke in the US, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to need this product in two years. Our product roadmapping process is very robust. So the, the culture is harmonious in that it all works together. And then when you interject a US customer in there, I need this and I need it yesterday. Being a sub supplier, also, people don't think of connectors first. And that right. was like it's... a hard lesson <laughs> learned for me when I started. It's like, oh, shoot, we need a power connector and we did it yesterday. So we have to be fast. We always joke here that, you know, by the time the customer makes up their mind and everything <laughs> gets settled, it took the same amount of time as if it had been properly planned. But I actually think this way working is a lot more fun. If you don't acknowledge the differences right away in the beginning of the conversation with someone in a different culture, then you're constantly just battling each other. So no matter if you're working with Germany, China, Romania, India, we have offices in Brazil, everybody has a different culture. And sometimes you just start the conversation with saying, I know you guys think I'm the crazy American cowboy because of the speed I want to work. But this is the motivation. And then if we can survive this, let's do it differently next time. And you hope that you have an opportunity to do it differently next time. I actually have an international business degree and I never thought that I would necessarily use it. But I realize now a lot of that stuff indirectly I end up using, right? In these situations, I've worked for German companies, I've worked for Japanese companies, I've worked for American companies. And there are these differences in knowing how to, you know, communicate the other person's language or at least understand how they're going to perceive what you're saying differently based on knowing where they come from. Knowing these cultural differences is really important. But I think the other thing is just like, yeah, we talk about technology, right? And you can go over email or with spec sheets or whatever. But if you actually have a little bit of background, you understand that person a little bit before you have these conversations. Yeah. Even if you know like one or two personal facts about them, mm -hmm. being able to start with that like point of connection so that if and when misunderstandings happen or clarifications need to be made, mm -hmm. it's a lot easier to deal with when you kind of feel a little bit more of a connection with the person on the yeah. other side. And although we are culturally, we have differences and all that stuff, like we're also kind of all the same, right? Yeah. And you end up learning to make those translations as, as weird as that sounds. Yeah, um, for sure. Whether it's like, yeah, metric to imperial or an actual <laughs> translation of intent. I think that's also something that like sales and engineering can do really well together if done well. Yeah. Instead of butting heads. It's like, we actually can help each other. We need each other to help translate. Um, Sometimes you have to translate between sales and engineering, even within the same company, same yeah. country. You know, it's a different language, different set of motivation. It makes a huge difference, doesn't it? And I'm sure in that innovation role, like a lot of what you do could be considered that, right? You're translating customers' problems and and requirements yeah. to back to engineering teams and say, hey, this is why maybe we should build this, right? Right. What motivates that? Do you think that they would be as successful if you like took your product engineers and the customers and put them together without we, the translator? <laughs> we try to put them together as often as possible, but sometimes you have to give the context. So yeah. I'll train my engineers to say, if you're talking to a customer and you feel like you have to deliver bad news. You can say, I know I'm being the engineer in the room, but I think that's going to take a little bit longer than expected. So you're giving your salesperson an inroads to say, I don't agree. And I'd like to talk about that in private before we commit to that. Or you're giving your salesperson to say, actually, you know, that's a really good point. So once again, you're like contextualizing your presence in the room. Yeah. Um, I think the bigger challenge is that if you have a engineer that doesn't like to be in front of customers, they may not feel comfortable like jumping in and interjecting into a high fast paced conversation. And that is where we really hire for soft skills and for technical skills. You can grow technical skills, but you can never make somebody be like a super outgoing engineer. So you kind of find um, 
the way to make people feel comfortable in a situation because that's where the great ideas are happening. And it, just because you're a quiet person does not mean that you don't have a million great ideas yeah. in your head. Yeah, that's why I try to make sure to give Allie an opportunity to talk because I will. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll talk the whole time yeah. and she just sits there. She's like, well, I didn't get a turn. <laughs> I think partnership dynamics, just you can get so much more out of a quality partnership, like yes. where people can actually play their strengths together. And as a people manager, you have to understand people's strengths because it's so easy to just see people's weaknesses. But like, what do you think your strengths are? And do you feel like you get a chance to shine in this work environment? Is do you want to go do more trade shows? Like if I had an engineer that said, my gosh, my dream would be be on Automation Ladies. Let's make it happen. Like just because it doesn't fit with your job title doesn't mean that can't be something that you get to experiment and do. Uh, yeah. you, you guys met with Mackenzie Reed earlier. So he was on my team and he said, I have a, I have a passion. I want to be a business owner. He still supports Harding. He's a part of the Harding team for like two or three hours a week. And it's scratches that technical itch for him, but he wanted to grow his career and had nothing to do with Harding connectors. And you go, okay, please I go I think shine. that's fantastic. And also just the ability to, for your best people to go learn and come back if they want to. Yeah. Like hugely. shutting the door on somebody that has a passion they want to follow And take it as a slight, like, oh, no, now you, Mm -hmm. you know, offended us and never come back. Right. I think you're closing the door to a huge opportunity of having someone with all of your knowledge, right? All the background on your products, go out, experience stuff in the real world with, in a different way, right? And then potentially come bring that knowledge right back. Right. Whether it's as a a partner, customer, somebody that comes back to work for the same company, but maybe Mm -hmm. in a different role. Um, Or they don't even come back, but they're just your biggest promoter. Absolutely. Because they're just like, look how cool this was. Yeah. And everyone's like, yeah, that is cool. Yeah. And it's, I think it's no different than talking about your personal branding, right? You guys, you have a personal brand outside of what you do in your day jobs, but you are using new skill sets that will help you back in your regular day jobs. And so we might find that somebody is an innovation engineer, but they also have this beautiful knack for marketing. Yeah. Let's let them grow that, even if they don't want it to be their full-time job. And that's what's great about working for a fast-growing company is like, there's so much opportunity for us. There's so much room to grow the brand that we can really do whatever we want. <laughs> is your favorite part the technological innovation or innovation in like how you work and how the people around you work? Yeah, it's the people, hands down for sure. I love working with the people. I love finding new ways to like approach problems, love working with our customers. Uh, I've been with Harding for almost eight years now. So like we know everybody pretty well and we've built a really good story together. Yeah. And you guys are doing a great job showcasing it. I feel like now I see you guys, Mm -hmm. you have a, not just a product, but a brand that I can feel more. Yeah. And probably that has to do with, cause I've met some of your people. Right. And then I I feel that kind of same vibe from more people that I've met. Mm -hmm. And for me as a, as a like millennial or I don't know, like I, that plays a big part for me. Like the technology needs to be solid. Yes. I know that the German engineering, like you're not yeah. getting a junk product. That's like the foundation yeah. of the brand is like, we don't enter the room unless you have a good product. Yeah. But when we're in the room, let me tell you about why we're a good company to work for. And then it's who do I want to work with? Yeah. Who do I know will have my back if I choose the wrong thing and now I need, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm SOL and I want someone to help <laughs> me. Uh, yes. And yeah, I love that you guys are facilitating conversations like this. I want to say thank you to Amanda again. Um, you know, you guys just are willing to go the American way and take some risks and try some stuff and have some fun with some people. And I think that, you know, it's paying off in a big way. And uh, we're going to have a lot of fun tonight. The manufacturing happy hour with our other friends, Gray Solutions, which have a very, for us from the outside, similar vibe of Mm -hmm. working together, collaborating, innovating. So is there anything more in particular you want to say about either connectors or innovation or what you're doing? Before we sign off to to try to have some more conversations here, this is this show is packed. Yes, this is a crazy show. I would say for anybody listening, feel free to call us, not last, but maybe earlier on, and we can make your product move <laughs> a little bit easier. But the real thing is connectors are everywhere. Yeah. And until you work for a company like Harding, you don't realize it, but they are everywhere. So we always play the game spot, the connector. The weirdest place I've seen connector was at a rave, okay. powering the sound hey. system. <laughs> you see them on roller coasters, you see them on trains, wherever you are. So Connected they are that. truly everywhere. It's one of those brands that's everywhere and you just don't know it. So I hope everyone gets a chance to interact with the product in some way. And uh, 
maybe it's a good sign if you haven't heard of it because it means they never fail in the field right <laughs> okay well yeah. thank you so much for having a chat with us and yeah, thank you for having me good to meet you. yeah like i said if you meet those if you have those people that are like we want to be on automation ladies bring them on absolutely <laughs> will do thank you thank you